praise God. Okay, well, we have been looking at the Sermon on the Mount. Some of you might have realized, some of you may not have realized. Um, but this is really our theme of living the kingdom life. We've been talking about living the kingdom life. And so I think the Sermon on the Mount is a fantastic way of embracing what Jesus is saying and living the kingdom life. And the kingdom life is so different uh, to the natural world or, or to the, certainly to the fall and the demonic world. In some ways, it's got a lot of similarities to the natural world because God created the earth. You'll see what I mean in a minute. Um, but uh, So we, have, we are challenged by that when we embrace Jesus because he basically cuts away the old. You know, he cuts away the stuff that the enemy's always trying to put on us. You know, I haven't really, you know, I, anyone who knows me is I'm an avid news reader and a news listener. But since March, I just switched it off. Because <laughs> I said the stuff that's coming through there is actually demonic. It's just completely fear-based and it will stress you out um, completely. And uh, I, was really, I was really surprised with myself. <laughs> Um, so I literally just put it on just to get a little bit of information or get the statistics. But I used to really get in there and understand exactly what's going on. But we have to be careful sometimes of what the world is bringing and if it's going to affect us or not, then actually just to put it to a side. Because actually we need to be tuned into what God's saying. And when we're tuned into what God's saying, sometimes it's very different um, to what the enemy is saying. As we looked at last week and as we were talking about last week, that God might be saying arise when everyone is saying hide and and be afraid. You know, sometimes it's very, very different what God is saying. So you cannot take your trends just from the world. Now, I'm not saying, you know, sometimes the media gets in line with God. That's great. You know, sometimes politicians get in line with God. Shock horror. That's great. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, you know, but you can't take your leading from there. We should be those that are leading the way. Amen. So I think it's true with all this living the kingdom life. It's about the king being in the center of our lives and being guided and governed by the king. Amen. So let's have a look at our scripture today because it's quite an interesting subject. As you can see, um, it's Sermon on the Mount 4. Now I cheated really because it's number 5 because I, I think I had a 3A and B. So I cheated a little bit there. I'm sorry about that. But anyway, this is part four. So um, let's have a look at what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 27 to 30 on this subject of dealing with lust, which is what we're doing today. Not really a very relevant subject in today's world, but I thought, you know, why not? Let's talk about it anyway. You know? <laughs> okay. So um, Matthew 5, 27. So I just need to... Um... <laughs> but yes, I realized... I realize nothing's happening, and I realize it's because I'm not doing anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, Jesus said here, You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay, the men have all checked out now. <laughs> um, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. Oops. Um, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. This is one of these times when Jesus is being pretty serious and pretty clear about things, isn't it? Um, and just, we'll get into that a bit more in a minute. But basically what Jesus is doing is... He is hitting the issues of the day. And these are still the issues today. Last time we looked at anger. This time we're looking at lust. And we'll look at what we mean by that in a minute. Um, but Jesus is basically deepening and bringing out the true meaning of the law. You know, um, and what we realize by that is, you know, the Pharisees said, well, okay, they looked at the, the I think it was the third commandment, or, four, or I forget which commandment it was now, which number it was. And they said, well, you shouldn't commit adultery. So they just took that as the actual act of going uh, being married and going and sleeping with another woman and therefore committing adultery, or she's mad and you're sleeping with her and you commit adultery. That's, they said, well, we, we haven't done that, therefore we haven't committed adultery. And Jesus is saying, hang on, I'm taking this thing much deeper and I'm putting it in the spirit. So actually my disciples are going to have the ability from the heart to be purified. And he was trying to challenge the Pharisees and those of his day to say, actually, this is not just religion trying to do the right thing, but this is uh, coming from the heart. This is actually from the heart. This is something that God um, wants us to do. So it has to be by his righteousness in the spirit. And so we saw the scripture, didn't we? For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. You might say, well, how can we exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and the, and the scribes and the Pharisees? Because 
you know, they were trying to get every letter of the law right. And he says, because that wasn't from the heart. That was a bit like a grave that looks nice on the outside, all, all bright and white with flowers, but instead full of dead man's bones. That's not coming from the heart. But he said, actually, the righteousness that we receive as the children of the king is in the spirit and is from the heart. We'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, and we fulfill all this righteousness so that we can shine for him without fear. And so therefore he says, and that's why we've got to be bold in these days, whether we're talking about issues of justice, whether we're talking about issues of purity. Um, people are going to disagree with us all over the place. You know, sometimes they're going to call us, oh, you, you extreme left-wingers. Then other than that, you extreme right-wing moralist bigots. You can't win as a Christian because we're never going to be on one side or the other. We're going to be on the kingdom side. Amen? Amen? We're going to say what God says about things. And so it's completely different. So... You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So God wants to purify our hearts so we can literally shine out his light. So can you see, it's different from scrubbing outwardly a tomb that's full of dead man's bones. This is about something right from the inside of you shining out beautifully and shining out brightly. In other words, we've got a connection in the spirit with heaven, Jesus was saying, and that comes through our spirits, kind of tries to get through the soul <laughs> and out into the world. Amen? And so that's what Jesus is talking about here. So you remember last time we dealt with anger um, and we said, we had to deal with anger from the heart. And uh, now we have to deal with lust as well. So let's take this, the lamp here. I don't know if you can see, but at the moment the lamp is turned off, yeah? And when we're born again, the lamp is turned on. I don't know if you can see the difference. You, you see it here maybe, but maybe not in the camera, I don't know. Um, you can, excellent. So, so can you see now, when you've been born again, your, your, the bulb is your spirit. That's the difference. Look, you look pretty much the same on the outside, but now you've repented, put trusted in Jesus for your salvation, and he's done something. The light switched on. Suddenly you can see things you couldn't see before. You're in touch in the spirit. You're alive. Some people might say, well, I don't see any difference. Some people might say, yeah, actually, I can see a glimmer of difference there. I can see, actually, this guy started to change his attitudes. This girl started to act a bit differently about things. Her values are somewhere else now. There's something that's different. You know, this person's become an encourager in the office rather than a, uh, someone who pulls people down when they walk out the room. You know what I mean? Something, I can see something that's different. Now, sometimes I've been baffled when, like, I remember going to one workplace um, where I was just a tent for six months, Westminster City Council, and I was walking down this long road, and the office I was in was at the end of the road, kind of at a dead end. And when I got in the office, and I was there, and I was sort of came to coffee break, and I was just chatting with a few other people, and one of the girls there said, somehow it came out I was a Christian, she said, I knew you were a Christian. I thought, what has you? Yeah, no, no, I knew. The minute I saw you walking down the road, I'm thinking, what on earth is she talking about? But there is something. There is something when you have Jesus in your heart that you become a temple of the Holy Spirit. Something's different about you. And people, you know, they look at you. I've seen people sometimes, they look at me twice. Sometimes when I'm in the shop or something. They're just, and I think God is, there's something, you're bringing something of the authority of God into a situation. You know, you're an ambassador for Christ. You know, as long as we're not intimidated, like you were saying today, Joe, not receive the spirit of t timidity or fear, but power, love, and discipline or a sound mind, then actually something's coming through you, authority. And sometimes we don't even realize who we are. We don't even realize who we are. But something's happening. So God then, but there's an issue here. You can't probably see it too much from me, but there is an issue here with the lamp. You see, the bulb is switched on. I'm, sp I'm born again in the spirit. But, thank you, <laughs> but in, in and, and I've got a body, but in between my spirit and my body is the soul. So the soul is there in between. Now, the problem with the soul is the soul, although the spirit's born again, the soul isn't totally renewed. So God is saying, we've got to get to the heart. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And the heart is like the garden of the soul. So there's sometimes still some weeds in there. And there's things that need to be pulled out. Have you ever noticed when you don't weed your garden? I've quite often noticed that. My, do my wife tells me. <laughs> but, no, but when you don't weed your garden, there's no room for the flowers and the fruit and the veg to grow. 
And so it kind of takes over. And so we have to weed the garden of our soul, which is our heart. Not our spirit now, because the spirit's born again. Jesus is there. And that's why you can be assured of your salvation. But there's a soul that is raging there. And so we have to deal with that. So sometimes we have to repent of anger. And when we do, as we talked about the first time, out comes a little bit more light can shine there now. Can you see that? Because you've dealt with that issue of anger. But then today we're dealing with the issue of lust. And so, you, so that's kind of blocking things a bit as well. And so you pull that out. And there should be some more in there because there's other things to deal with as well. But you know what I mean. So thank you. <laughs> so, so what Jesus is saying is let your light shine. There's got to be boldness in that. There's got to be a radic radicality about that as well where I say, actually, I'm going to deal with the issues of anger before God. I am going to deal with the issues of, of lust before God. Because Jesus is now saying adultery isn't just the technical term of sleeping with someone when you're married or when they're married. No, he's talking about lust. He's talking about purity in everything, whether you're married or unmarried. It's that, that's what he's dealing with. He's saying it goes much deeper than that because I'm looking at the heart. So God wants us to deal with these things from the heart. Now today is harvest so some churches are celebrating harvest today. And that's kind of a celebration of the fruit that's produced from the earth. Yeah? And of everything God's given us. And sometimes we offer some of that back to God. But I think it's a good thing to look at in that sense, to be thankful for what God's given us. But also to look at how the earth works. We said in nature, you can see the kingdom of God. So if you let weeds grow up in your ground, then it stops the fruit coming. So we have to weed. We have to be proactive and weed things out of the soul and how can we know what to weed out of the soul? Well, when you read the Bible, it says it's like a mirror. It reflects who you are. Have you ever noticed that? Sometimes you go, ouch. And that means there's something in the soul that isn't the same as who you are in the spirit. That needs to change and be repented of. And then sometimes you look at it and you go, yes. I'm a new creation. So it does two things. It reflects who you are in Christ in the spirit. But it also sometimes goes, ouch. I'm not demonstrating that in an area of my soul. And that's what Jesus does. And so he wants us to be able to live out the kingdom life. Not just say, I've got life. He who has a son has life. But I'm walking in the light. I'm walking in the life. It's making a difference in my mind, in my thinking, in how I treat other people, in my family, in my neighborhood. There's a difference that's being demonstrated there. And so we can see that even in nature. Now, it was um, a Christian scholar called Tusker who said, if... Jesus' disciples are called to be a moral disinfectant in the world where moral standards are low, i.e. we can't take our standards from the world, yeah? Constantly changing or non-existent. Did you know 10 years from now, the whole moral code will be different again to it is today, to how it was 30 years ago, to how it was 100 years ago? So if, if it keeps changing or is non-existent, they can discharge this function only, in other words, we can discharge this function of being a moral disinfectant only if they themselves retain their virtue. So that's why we need to be in the presence of Jesus. That's why we need to read the word, because it begins to show us who we are and what we need to get rid of. So we can distinguish the difference. Have you ever found it hard in the world to sometimes to distinguish, well, is this right or wrong? You've got to look in a different place. You've got to look at the eternal word of God that is a portal to heaven and to the heart of Jesus. And then he will guide you through this kind of craziness that's in our world today. You know, some things aren't as clear as others, are they? You know, do I do this? Don't I do this? You know, and you have to actually let God guide you by his word and by the spirit. It was Eric Little. I don't know if any of you saw that film um, which uh, portrayed Eric Little's life. Um, but Eric Little was the Olympic gold medal winner and missionary to China. Uh, Chariots of Fire, some of you may have seen it. And um, that was a film about him. And he said, a holy life is a voice. Isn't that powerful? A holy life, when you take the word holy, it means a different life. A life that reflects God's kind of life, yeah? A holy life is a voice. It speaks when the tongue is silent. Isn't that interesting? It speaks when the tongue is silent. I, I knew you were a Christian. There's something different about it. Not because you jumped on the table in the office and said, everybody give their lives to Jesus right now. No, it's not because of that that they knew you were a Christian. But there's something that's different about your attitude and the life and, and your courage to help people or say, I'll, I'll pray for you. Or, How's it going with your grandma? Or, you know what I mean? There's something different about the way you do your work. Um, 
And so a holy life is a voice. It speaks when the tongue is silent and is either a constant attraction or a perpetual reproof. That's true, isn't it? <laughs> Even people who are attracted to us, or they're like, they're continually feeling like we're condemning them. We're not condemning them, but they continue to feel like we're, because something in our life is shining out, and it's shining a light on something in their life. Have you ever seen when you say, well, I'm just going to come to this place, and I'm just going to do my real best and everything else, it becomes a problem for everybody. Because you're showing up that they're not doing their real best now, <laughs> you know? And so, actually, you know, do the right thing, but sometimes people are not going to like it. Sometimes people are not going to like it. But that's not for you to become intimidated by that. You ought to just be courageous and loving and keep forgiving those people. And keep loving those people because there's something God wants to do in their life as well. For them to realize who they are. And that God loves them and they can be forgiven and receive the gift of righteousness. And they just as much can demonstrate what they're meant to demonstrate in their lives. And it might be a bit different to what you demonstrate in your life. And that's okay. Because God loves variety. But we all demonstrate the kingdom of God. So... What then is lust? What is lust? We're using this word lust. Um, well, I'll come to that in just a sec second. But I just wanted to quote this as what Andy Mason, who said, spiritual maturity always displays itself in changed relationships. Isn't that great? You can't say, hey, I really love God. Yeah. Hate you. Yeah. It's all right. God's all right. It's just the people that are the problem. You know, if there were no people in this church apart from me, this church would be perfect. Really? <laughs> really? Come on. Spiritual maturity always displays itself in changed relationships. Who we are with other people reveals who we are with Christ. So our relationship with others says something about our relationship with God. Have you ever been really released with God and suddenly been able to just overcome everything with others? Have you ever had some of those experiences sometimes? That's what I've had sometimes where just, boom, once you're really in relationship with God, then, hey, I love these people. This is, these are God's creation, warts and all, you know? I mean, look at yourself, you know? Warts and all, <laughs> God still loves you, you know? So that's great, isn't it? Um, so a definition of lust, just, just for fun this morning. Um, intense sexual desire. That's how we normally think of it, isn't it? I'm just I'm I'm doing this definition just from a, a dictionary definition, okay? So intense sexual desire, overwhelming or overwhelming desire or craving. Because sometimes it can be an absolutely overwhelming desire to do good. It can be a craving for a purpose. So the word lust just means I'm, you know, I've got a zeal for something. But we often relate it, don't we, to an intense sexual desire. Yeah? Um, lust is about physical or sexual attraction, whereas love might encompass lust, but it's more emotional and is about actually caring for the other person. Okay, we may or may not agree with that definition. It's just a definition, but actually, it does start to kind of get to the heart of the matter. Kind of lust is a bit more about take. Love is a bit more about caring for the other person, yeah? yeah? And about give. So there's, there's some kind of definition that's coming in there a bit. So I'm going to now define some New Testament words that maybe will help us a bit as well. So the word eros is one of the words for love that the Bible uses. Um, and it's the romantic or sexual attraction kind of love. So Jesus didn't say that was a bad thing. In fact, we know that Paul said, you know, this is actually a gift from God. You know, um, the romantic and sexual attraction. So God put it in the earth. It's not like that's what the devil brought to the earth. But it's more about it being guided by agape. Does that make sense? And that's the other kind of love. So agape is God, the God kind of love. So let's look at what is the God kind of love. Well, the God kind of love is a covenant God. He's going to be committed to you if he has relationship with you. There's an intimacy and a commitment. Um, he's going to die for you so that actually you can live. Yeah? He's selfless. He's sacrificial. He's unconditional in his love. So that's the agape love. It's a committed covenant kind of love. It's not just going to you to get something and then leave you devastated emotionally or with a child to bring up by yourself or confused about relationships. Do you understand what I mean? That's, that's the lust. That's just the, it's the romantic or sexual but without the commitment of the agape. And that's why God instituted marriage, so that there was a commitment of agape, so that actually that romantic sexual love could be 
protected, that, the, that as the man or the woman are receiving that, they can actually totally trust each other in God and know they're not going to be let down. And so that was a protection put there. It's a bit like, I've always said the sexual relation is a bit like fire, you know. In the wrong place, it will burn your house down. Yeah? It's going to hurt you. In the right place, in the fireplace, it's going to be nice and warm and it's going to help you. <laughs> yeah? So it has to be in the right place. So Jesus goes on here and, sorry, I'll come back to that in a minute. So Jesus um, goes on here and he says, lusting after a woman in your heart means meditating on the strong desire. There's nothing wrong with sexual emotions or romantic, that's okay, that's not normal, completely normal. <laughs> okay, everybody? Yeah, okay. But it's when we meditate on that strong desire with no intention of commitment, yeah? Why? Because God is looking for loyalty. Our first loyalty is to God. We are in covenant with Jesus. We are the bride of Christ. So even in our relationship with God, there's a commitment, isn't it? There's a, we cut covenant with God, and then we get baptized, and we leave the old behind, and we say, you're my first love. Amen? You're my true love. And then we love everyone else out of, on the basis of our love for God. We're his bride. And so in the same way, we're to reflect that on the earth. We're to have one wife for life or one husband for life, to be committed to that. Also, we are to see God's creation as glorious, not just objects for our sa sexual satisfaction. So, you know, for men, that is quite hard. We'll look at that a bit more in a minute. But actually, it's to see a woman. When you see a woman, she's beautiful. But to thank God for her beauty. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. But to lust is to, is to, is to actually go further than that and to actually be fantasizing about things that, um, that God says is only in a committed relationship, you know. So the heart of the matter really is the matter of the heart. We see how there's so much exploitation and with pornography and with everything else, the enemy is so easily able to capture uh, men and women's minds and hearts today, you know, it's both. And, and actually that means that we then start relating to people, not in an honoring way of thank God for this beautiful creation that he's made, you know, but we start to, to look at it in a, in a corrupt way. And obviously, if you start thinking that way, you're going to then start acting that way eventually. Um, but Jesus said, don't even do that in your heart. So you have to ask the question, what am I planting in my heart or what weeds are there in there? And so we need to get those out like we saw out of the lamp, take those things out. So how does Jesus tell us to deal with this how can we deal with lust so the first we deal with lust the the jesus way so deal with lust the jesus way so what does he say here um he says and if your right eye causes you to sin tear it out hmm interesting i'm glad that jesus believed in metaphors <laughs> so be Quite a few blind people. <laughs> I'm glad Jesus believed in metaphors, you know. <laughs> and um, for it's better for you to lose one of your members and your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Okay? So that sounds quite painful to me and quite radical. So what he's saying is, that's what he wants us to be, pretty radical. He wants us to go, radix means to go to the root of something, from the Latin. So he wants us to go to the root and chop things off and change things, um, metaphorically speaking, praise the Lord. So, you know, that takes a few things. That takes an internal change. That takes, that's why we do things like ancient paths, because we ask the Father, Father, where's this coming from? And then he reveals something to us. And then we pray about it. And then we break that thing and we change that thing. And people find real freedom when they pray those deep prayers with God. Things change in their lives. You know, um, I didn't have ancient paths when I was younger. But as a teenager, I was full of lustful thoughts. And we switched the camera off because I wouldn't want everyone on Facebook Live to be hearing this. No, just checking. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, and when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, that's when God really began to 
purify my heart. And I would find, literally, I would sometimes start praying at 10 o'clock at night, and I'd sometimes come up at 3 or 4 in the morning. And I'd just been weeping before God, laughing before God, praying in tongues, worshipping, enjoying God. I mean, I was having a ball. And I thought I'd been down there for half an hour. But I'd be like, what? And it's, God would really take me on a journey. He'd really, this wasn't, this wasn't doing my religious duty. You know what I mean? This was enjoying Jesus. This was amazing. And you know what I'd find sometimes incredible things would happen, which is what happens on ancient bars, was suddenly <laughs> some emotional or perverted feeling would just leave me. I would just suddenly find, I'm changed. I'm pure now. Something's happened to me. And God will really do heart surgery if we'll engage with him. You know, so that's why we have those sort of inner healing things like ancient bars. Renewing of the mind. You know, Proverbs 4.20 says, um, says this. It says, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart. So you have to get God's word in your heart. And I'm always talking about, that's what I'm talking about, meditating on the word. For they are life to those who find them and health to their whole body. You know, you'll be healthier in every way as you meditate on God's word. There's a purifying power in the word of God. And then watch over your heart with all diligence. A bit like you'd watch over your garden. You know, heart with all diligence. For from it flow the springs of life. See, if you allow your heart to be in the right place, then life comes from you. You feel more energetic. You can get more done. You feel like, wow. You know, there's so many distractions, isn't there? With social media, you've got Facebook, you've got um, Instagram, you've got, let's keep going, Twitter, and others. <laughs> okay, sorry, my Snapchat, there we go. I know there's loads of others as well. <laughs> um, so we can get so distracted by things. Um, and we want to have a strong desire, a lust for the right things, for God and for his purposes, not for the wrong things, you know, or get caught up in the stresses of life. Um, so watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put devious word, speech far from you. Let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. And there's times that you'll know as men and as women where you just have to fix your gaze. Maybe something else wants to distract you as you're walking down the road, or you're driving, whatever, or, or maybe it's on social media, but you have to fix your gaze straight ahead. No, I'm focusing on what God's saying to focus on. Um, watch the path of your feet, and all your ways will be established. Isn't that great? If you can actually do that and focus on what Jesus says to focus on, your ways will be established. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. Turn your foot from evil. So let me tell you a story. Every man's story, every man's story, every woman's story, is that there are distractions that can take us and lead us um, in the wrong direction. And so what Jesus is saying here is we have to lay those things down and you've got to sometimes maim yourself, metaphorically speaking. I don't want anyone else to go out of here now and <laughs> hurt themselves, okay? <laughs> metaphorically speaking, okay? Um, you, you sometimes have to maim yourself. What do I mean by maim yourself? You have to say, I can't go there. I can't do that thing. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. No, I actually can't. It's like if you, if you have an issue with alcohol and you're an alcoholic, everyone says, oh, it's okay to drink a glass of wine, not a problem. That's fine, but not for me. I can't go there, and I'm not going to be silly with it. it doesn't, it's going to take me in the wrong direction. You know, it's going to take me, first it's going to be alcohol, then it's going to be um, spliff, then it's going to be hard drugs. You know? That's the direction I'm going in. You know? So that person knows, no, I can't do that. So there's no point in trying to say, hey, be liberated in Christ. Have some wine. Don't be so silly. No, you can't do it. And you have to know. Jesus said, if. He didn't say everybody. He said, if your right eye. So if you know that's you, then you do the right thing. You do the steps. You say, oh, you're being so religious. No, I'm not being religious. I'm saving my life, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for your encouragement in the wrong direction. <laughs> you know. So for you, you know you can't go there. It's a bit like there's a cliff edge. And why would you go right up? To, it's a windy day. Why would you go right up to the cliff edge? And say, oh, let's see how close we can get. Boom, boom. <laughs> Just broken your neck. Just broken an arm. Why would you do that? No, you would say, there's the cliff edge. Here's my boundary. I'm going to enjoy this walk. You know? <laughs> and so you've got to be wise. You've got to love your life. You've got to be wise with your life. God loves you. You know where you can go and where you can't go. Well, everyone else has got a, uh, I don't know, Facebook account. Well, you can't have one right now. Or everyone else is on YouTube. Right now, you know you can't do that. 
It just doesn't work for you. Not a problem. Move in wisdom. And so we have to move intentionally in, in the direction that God wants and, and walk in that kind of loyal, hesed love and be serious about what God has for us. You know, there's one guy who was praying. Um, my old pastor, David Cassidy, told me this story. He was praying with a guy years ago in Oxford to be delivered from a spirit of lust. And he was praying and praying, and this thing wouldn't go. And he said, what's going on? Has it gone? No, no, it hasn't gone. And he was praying and praying. And then this guy kind of went in the spirit, and he dressed the demon. And he said, you know, come out. And, and the spirit actually spoke out. This guy and said, no, I don't have to. He said, yes, you do. He said, no, I don't have to. He's got um, pornographic magazines under his bed. Oops. <laughs> so he had given a right. Can you see? He'd given a right for something to remain with him. So then... David kind of slaps him around the face and says, hi. And he waits and says, let's go and deal with those magazines under your bed. What? <laughs> and then that thing easily came out. Because it's actually to do with your will. God won't violate your will. And the devil only does things by permission. We don't always realize we're giving permission. But we're often giving permission. And we don't realize. So you have to repent of that. And sometimes deal with something physically. Maim yourself in some way. I am not going to look at something. Or sometimes restrict yourself. Because he says... Uh, not only cut off your, uh, gouge out your eye, but he also says, throw it away. And he also says, um, cut off your hand. Somewhere else he also says, cut off your foot. Illust interesting metaphors, aren't they? In other words, don't do certain things you were doing before. So you might be made, well, I can't do those things. I can't do those things. Because if I go to those parties, I end up doing the wrong thing. Now, someone else might be completely fine going in there, fellowshipping in there, being like Jesus with the prostitutes and sinners and... There's not a problem. So I'm not being legalistic here. Do you understand what I'm saying? But I'm saying if you know it's not going to work for you, don't do it. Amen. Don't do it. And your foot, cut your foot. Don't go to those places. <laughs> Make it hard for yourself. So you have to be radical with your own life. I hope that makes sense. Secondly, I think we need to understand the consequences Sorry, I'll come back to that in a second, sorry. That, yeah. No, I've covered that. That's fine. So what I'm saying is there is an internal and an external part to this thing. Your eye is where you're looking, isn't it? What you're focusing on. So, so, so spiritually, you have to focus on the right thing. So you're guarding your heart. But then your, your, your hand is what you do. So sometimes you've got to stop doing something, which will help you internally. And sometimes you've got to stop looking or focusing on something, which will help you internally. Sometimes it's internal to external, but it's also external to internal. Does that make sense? Okay. Right. We've got that. We can go on to number two. Understand the consequence. I think sometimes we don't understand the consequence of our actions as well. He says, it's better for you to pluck out, gouge out your eye, so that um, your whole body doesn't go into hell. Or cut off your hand so your whole... Um, body doesn't go into hell. Does that make sense? So sometimes he's saying, you're going to have a hell of a time if you go down that road. You're going to break relationships. You're going to hurt yourself in a big way. He's saying, be wise. You're going to, in fact, they've done studies now. Um, some of us guys were talking about this. They've done studies now where they can see that actually things like pornography actually affects your brain. It actually changes the shape of your brain and messes you up. And so you can't even think as clearly. You can't be as effective in your life. So when Jesus said things, he wasn't just saying, uh, what do you enjoy? Nah, you can't do that. It was never like that. Ten commandments. Nah, I'm not going to let you have any fun. not going to let you do anything. No, if you look at every single thing that Jesus said, or even the ten commandments, it's to protect you and it's to bless you so your mind can work well, so you can have good relationship, faithful relationship. It's all about that. And that's what we, we misunderstand sometimes. Otherwise, you drive yourself into hell. Now, I know we're saved by grace, but I'm saying you can have a living hell, you know. If your soul is all messed up, you can have a living hell. You know, some men in America are living in cars because they couldn't be faithful. And so they ended up with children, lots of children over the place, and the maintenance they have to pay out now because of the divorce and everything, they can only live in a car. They literally don't have enough money to survive because all their money is going out in Alamy. Is it Alamy they call it? Alimony, thank you. So I was speaking in tongues. Um, so women without husbands are there then as well. And they're unprotected and they're hurt 
and they're hardened and they're having to do all the work. So can you see this thing as a destructive thing? When we don't get it, when we don't get eros controlled by agape, it becomes destructive to our brain, to our own emotions and life, to other people's emotions and life, to our children, to our money, to society. Kids grow up without father. All kinds of things start happening. So, and then, you know, so all these things, when we cast off restraint, when we don't have a clear vision of what God says, we cast off restraint, it starts hurting us. And we need to look at, you know, temptation in this way. Temptation is sure to come, but don't yield to it. It's going to come. Has anyone ever had temptation coming to them? (laughs) Of course we have. Yeah, so... um, but James 1 describes it like this. He says, when tempt- uh, James 1 verse 13 to 15 is like this. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. No. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own lusts or evil desires, it says in this version, and enticed. So in other words, the devil knows where our weakness is, and he will entice us in that direction, and then we give in to that. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So the consequences, we're going towards death. Death is where we're separated from those that we know or love. So we almost die to to, to God's... God is present, but we die to the sensitivity of his presence. Does that make sense? We die to where God really wants to take us to. And that, now that's been proven even scientifically in your brain. It kind of is cutting you off from things that God has for you. So um, you find you can't hear God. You feel like you're in a living hell um, while being, you know, kind of alive. You feel like you're in hell kind of thing. And it's better to be radical and cut something off from the root. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, suffer loss to gain. Suffer loss to gain. That's what Jesus is actually saying. Suffer loss to gain. You know, today we live in a society where I want to feel everything. I want to experience everything. And Jesus says, no, don't do it. Suffer loss to gain. You know, suffer loss to gain. And so um, there's an interesting scripture in uh, 1 Peter um, which I've meditated on over the years. Very interesting. I don't know if you've noticed it. In 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2, um, it says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves with this same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives in evil human desires, but rather to the will of God. So there's something about cutting something off, saying, I'm not going there. I'm not and it feels like it's, Pain. It feels like you're denying yourself, taking up your cross and following him. You are. (laughs) You're dying daily to something. But in dying to it, it says, actually, now you live your earthly life for the will of God. Now you don't keep in that habitual sin, but you walk in a freedom. Okay? What else does Jesus say? Natural things to be aware of. Well, I think this is important to understand natural things to be aware of. Now, what I'm going to share now is a little bit general, and you might say, well, it's not always like that, and you'll be right to say that. You'll be right to say that. It's like if we say it's only men that suffer, suffer, suffer in terms of pornography. That's not true. Men and women do. But it has tended to be. So when I'm saying these things now, I'm saying what the tendency has been towards. Yeah? Does that make sense? But I'm not saying it's only like that. So let's take men and women. So as a man, you tend to... Um, crave physical intimacy, a tendency towards men. Just to be aware of how, how our psychology is, we tend towards craving um, physical intimacy. Women tend towards craving emotional intimacy. You know, talk to me, tell me how you feel, let's share together. Tend towards that, yeah? As a, again, I'm not saying it's always like that, but these are tendencies. And it's good to be aware of just natural things like that. Uh, men tend towards... Giving love to get sex. That tends to be, we, we see that happening, don't we? Giving love to get sex. Women tend towards giving sex to get love. 
unfortunately, the guys often abandon them afterwards. Yeah? Um, men, t body, tend towards, can disconnect from mind, heart, and soul. So things can become just very physical. Yeah? Women, it tends to be more body, mind, heart, and soul are intricately connected. So actually, that's why you see a lot of hurt women having engaged in something, and then they find, you know, that actually there's no commitment there. And that, that can bring a lot of pain. Not saying it doesn't bring pain to men as well, but I'm just talking about tendencies. Yeah? Um, recurrent physical needs cycle. A man will have recurrent physical needs where he feels that he, he sexually... He feels those things. I don't think anyone's going to dispute that with me, are you? <laughs> okay, all right. Um, with a woman, recurrent emotional needs cycle. There's a recurrent emotional needs cycle that actually I need someone to understand, I need someone to engage with me on an emotional level, yeah? And then finally, a vulnerability to unfaithfulness in the absence of physical touch. That can be a temptation for man, a vulnerability to unfaithfulness in the absence of physical touch. And for a woman, the vulnerability to unfaithfulness tends to be in the absence of emotional connection. He's not talking to me. Someone in the office says, if I was your husband, I would, I would spend time. I'd really understand you. I'd buy you flowers. I think you're worth it. Oh, my gosh. Temptation is starting, isn't it, for the woman if she's not getting that. So that's just things to be aware of. I'm not sealing them in stone. You understand? I'm just saying... It's good to be kind of aware of natural things that can cause issues. So the thing I would say is don't feed it because let God meet our needs. Let us have a heavenly focus which will equip us for the earthly battle. The Holy Spirit and fire, the cleansing of the soul. So now don't forget, this is what I wanted to say as well. Attraction isn't sin. Attraction is attraction. Hey, he's a handsome guy. Hey, she's a good looking girl. That's not sin. That's just appreciating the beauty of God, yeah? It's appreciating the beauty of nature. There's nothing wrong with that. But temptation, and temptation isn't sin. Because guess what? Temptation is sure to come. So when the devil now presents you with something, that's not sin. But lusting, Jesus is saying, is sin. When you take that to lusting, then that's sin. Your thoughts become sin. Um, because... The lusting can both affect you, but you could also do things to affect the other person and cause them to lust as well. You know, I think, you know, if a man is too touchy or flattering, that could attract a woman in some way or cause her to, to lust. If a woman dresses in a certain way, and I don't mean attractively, but if she says she's in a sexual way, I think you know, ladies, that does something to men, Yeah. So it's just to be aware of those things. Isn't this a, a wonderful Sunday morning we're having together today? <laughs> okay. Jesus, why do you put these things in the Bible? No. <laughs> okay. So then finally, my fifth and final point is be realistic. Be realistic. And I think that's what Jesus is being. He's being realistic when he says, you know, metaphorically speaking, cut things off. He's being realistic. You know, somebody said, no, I'm a Christian. I can overcome. I can go anywhere I want. Oops. That's not being realistic. Be realistic. So have certain things, you know, certain um, boundaries. Okay. So what does the Bible say then? The Bible says, flee immorality. You know, it's interesting the Bible often says, resist temptation. I bind you. This one doesn't say, just, 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 just leg it. <laughs> I think that's realistic. There, have you noticed there's some things you're just going to be in trouble if you go there. So it doesn't say, you know, don't bargain with it. Don't, you know, don't debate it. Just get out of there. Get away. You know what I mean? This is going to go wrong. This is not a situation I can handle. That's being realistic. And so I love this scripture. It says, run from sexual sin. Flee immorality, another version says. Run from sexual sin. No other sin is so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body, your own person, because you, you get connected. Something changes in you emotionally. When you, when you engage in the sexual relationship. So he says, get out of there. And um, Ephesians 5 says, but among you there must not 
be even a hint of sexual immorality, of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. So, you know, he puts greed in there with impurity and, and sexual immorality, because he's saying, basically, it's taking rather than giving. Whereas if you always think of giving to someone, blessing someone, then actually, that turns that whole thing around, yeah? Um... So we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? We overcome by claiming the blood of Jesus. We overcome by knowing what he's done for us and who he's made us and that he's cleansed us and we can repent and we can open up our hearts to him and we can talk about those things. By the word of our testimony, you know, so I, the blood of the Lamb, let me go back to that one, the cutting covenant. You know, sometimes we think of the blood of the Lamb just in cleansing us, but actually it's the commitment that he made to us and that's the covenant we have with him. It's like a marriage. And, you know, when I come to Jesus, I don't say to him, well, my goal, Jesus, is not to sin. My goal is not to sin against you. My goal is not to, um, you know, commit sin. No, that's like me coming to my wife on the wedding day and saying, well, darling, my goal is not to commit adultery. Do you think she's going to marry me? It's not a goal. I can't have a goal not to commit adultery. No, I promise not to commit adultery. Amen? Amen. It's a covenant. And it's the same with God. It's not, oh, well, I'll try my best, God. No, 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 no. I promise. You are my Lord. You're my Lord. My Savior and my Lord. I'm not going to hurt you, God. And you know, the reason I don't commit adultery, the reason I don't um, do those things isn't because I'm such a great guy. It's because I don't want to hurt Jesus. And I don't want to hurt the woman that Jesus gave me or the family Jesus gave me. So it's a worship. I, I don't do those things out of worship. Amen? Does that make sense? And so it's really important that we have that close walk with Jesus. Um, and then the word of our testimony. When we speak, so we don't only have that covenant, the blood of Jesus, but we speak what he says we pray it. We affirm the truth. And then we love not our lives unto death. I think that's the running away thing. That's the maiming yourself thing, isn't it? Sometimes we have to cut off things. We have to let go of things. And um, that's, what, that's what does it. I, one of the first things when I was filled with the Holy Spirit was that I, when I was 15 years old, I had to repent of chasing girls in school and stop chasing girls. And as soon as I did that, funny enough, within a few weeks, Dorcas had walked into our youth club and... Uh, Couple of, you know, a couple of years later we went out and then a few years later we got married. And so when you give up, God will give to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. When you give up, God will give to you. Um, you know, I made a choice. And believe you me, as a, a young man, I would want to look at pornography. I, I, I can't say I never looked at uh, page three on the sun in the past when I was a teenager. If, 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 you, if you're English, you know what that means. Um, but when I was filled with the Spirit again, I repented of those things, and I made a, I made a covenant with my eyes. I'm not going to look at pornography. So guys at school say, hey, we've got some magazines. Let's go around the back and look at those. No. Ah! They, called, they called me certain names. Yeah? We will not go there. They called me certain names because I wouldn't look at it. Yeah? We won't go there. No. <laughs> We're in church. No. Um, and you have to suffer for righteousness' sake. Amen? You have to suffer for righteousness' sake. Um, I remember a young lady being in, when I moved out, I was living with another guy, and the young lady just was in, in the house, using that, asked if she could study there. And, uh, okay, I'll tell you, it was actually Dorcas. So, <laughs> and she was studying there. And, but when I came back from where I'd been, I just knew I wasn't right. Do you understand what I mean? I thought, I can't actually go up there right now because I don't feel I'm in the right place. So you know what I did is I walked around the block another time and I worshipped Jesus. And then when I came in, I was going to say, hi, okay, I'll walk you home now. And I walked her home to her house. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so we have to deal with our emotions and deal with things. And we're, cool, this has got quite deep today, hasn't it? But I'm just saying, we need to be realistic about our situation. I'm trying to be honest about how I've dealt with those things. So there has to be a radical replacement of our desire for our self-life, for a desire with God. I think there's the, the, that stories of the sirens, is it? And they're on, is it 
they're on the boat. And, and, and if, you, if you look at these kind of mermaids, I think it was, or women, the sailors, then they will, their, their ships will be dragged onto the rocks and they'll all be destroyed. And so how could they overcome that? They couldn't because they would sing and the music, and they, it would just take them their emotions and take them, and they would want to look, and then the ships would crash. So um, I don't know if it was Sinbad or if it was Jason and the thing, I can't, Jason and the Argonauts, is it? Yeah, and he, their suggestion, you know what they said? said, let's sing ourselves. So they sang and overcame the distraction. So let's worship and overcome the distraction and save our souls. Okay, so that said, be realistic. So some, um, our, our true worship then is to offer our bodies to God. Amen? Romans 12, 1 to 2, and not be conformed to this world. And so here's some practical keys to finish. So if you want these, I've given you enough, but if you want these practical keys, five things. Don't put yourself in vulnerable positions. I think we've realized that, haven't we? Second key, guard your eyes, yeah? And meditate on, um, and put your eyes on the right things. Number three, meditate on the word. We talked about Proverbs 4, 20, 27, that that changes our hearts. It's like weeding the garden, putting the right thing in. Get people to hold you accountable, it's a bit practical. Hey, I need some help. And a lot of the guys, they do that. You know, they say to me, okay, look, just hold me accountable to this or hold me accountable or, you know. Get yourself held accountable. And fifthly, pray. Because when we worship Jesus, as I said, it takes us to the right place. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for calling us to be radical understanding our soul life, understanding our flesh life. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us clear, practical answers to you know, maim ourselves in certain areas, to deny ourselves in certain areas, so, and to distract ourselves or to obsess ourselves with your presence, with your word. And Father, we pray that you would work in our hearts at this time and help us to walk in that purity. So we repent, Father, for things we've not shut off. Maybe it's something electronic. Maybe it's something paper. Maybe it's something... We, we want to make a covenant with our eyes today and with our minds to do the right thing. So we repent of that. Father, maybe there's some things God's putting in our heart right now saying to us, yeah, you shouldn't really do that right now. Maybe it's not bad in itself, but it's just not right for you right now. Maybe just say, God, yeah, I just make that commitment to you today. Holy Spirit, I hear this, the hints that you're giving me, and I repent of that, and I say, Lord, I make a covenant with my eyes. I'll put that thing right. I'll be faithful to you. And if I'm married, faithful to my partner. And we thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for dealing with our hearts, Lord, today. Thank you, Jesus. And Jesus, we pray that we would be so filled with your spirit that we would be engaged in the things of God rather than the things that would distract us in this world, that we can love rather than lust, that we can care um, rather than indulge. Father, we ask you to help us in these ways. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Just believe God's doing things in our hearts right now. Just let him pinpoint those things. Just let him take out what he wants to take out at this time. And let him renew you. Let him fill you with his new wine, with his Holy Spirit, with his purity, with his fullness. Let him deal with those things as you just come into his presence. Thank you, Lord. Maybe God's given you in your mind someone to hold you accountable. Thank you, Lord. Let's just act on the things God says to us today. And we thank you, Lord, you said, if we confess our sins, you're faithful, you're just to forgive us our sins. And not only forgive them, because we know they're forgiven in heaven already. We know you call us the righteousness of God in Christ already. But to cleanse us, our souls, from all unrighteousness, all the things that are kind of a bit crooked, putting them straight. And we thank you for doing that today. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Isn't he? Shall I go up to the other mic? This back, okay, brilliant. Sorry if you couldn't hear me for a minute. I was just saying, grab some bread and wine and, uh, and then, or juice and cracker, and then we can just break bread together. 
So thank you, Jesus, that on the night you were betrayed, you took bread and you broke it. And you said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So right now, we're just going to celebrate with the bread. And we thank you, Jesus, for this, your body that was broken for us to make us whole. And as we take it now, we take it by faith, thanking you for all the benefits that it gives to us. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. After supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. This is, covenant means to cut in the Hebrew, berit. This is the new cutting, the new commitment I make to you. This is the new selfless, unconditional commitment I make to you in my blood as your husband, as your bridegroom. And we today take this blood and we say, thank you, Jesus, for the representation of your blood here. And we say, thank you for the benefits of your blood, that you're 100% committed to us. You've died for us, and you've shown that prophetically um, in this, this wine. And we want to thank you for that. And we therefore say, we also come into your covenant. We thank you for your covenant that has cut us off from the past. We thank you that we've been baptized and laid the old down so we can walk fully now in the new and we say we walk with you not just as our savior but as our lord as well and we want to be maimed we want to deny ourselves and take up the cross and follow you so that we can walk in that resurrection life thank you jesus thank you. amen blood of christ shed for you for the forgiveness of sins amen amen thank you lord we're going to finish